My name is uh, J.K. Haynes. I am a professor in, in the Department of Biology and president of the Delta of Georgia chapter Phi Beta Kappa here at Morehouse. I'm pleased to welcome you and our speaker, Dr. Michael Lomax, to this Phi Beta Kappa Crown Forum. Phi Beta Kappa is the nation's oldest and most prestigious honor society. The chapter at Morehouse was established in 1968, and this was one of the last major efforts of Benjamin Mays before his retirement as president of the college. In addition to inviting students for membership who have outstanding academic records, another goal of Phi Beta Kappa is to promote scholarship. And to this end, we have brought to the college over the last three years, two leading scholars who spent several days with us one who talked about her research on implicit bias and the other her, her research on the criminal justice system. Phi Beta Kappa is also one of the nation's leading exponents of the value of a liberal education. In the rush to prepare students for the job market, we sometimes forget the importance of preparing students for life, which is the goal of a liberal arts institution like Morehouse. And I would argue that there is really no better preparation for the job market than a liberal arts education. Uh, increasingly, I hear from recruiters for graduate and professional schools and from individuals who are recruiting our students for the workforce that they are looking for broadly educated persons, individuals who communicate well, both verbally and in writing, individuals who respect different cultures, and individuals who can solve interdisciplinary issues or problems. This is the goal of Morehouse that we sometimes forget. Yet another goal of liberal education is to produce graduates who are committed to participating in the civic affairs of their communities, which is in alignment with the tradition at Morehouse of producing leaders. The scholar activist tradition among black scholars such as W.E.B. Du Bois is a model of this goal of a liberal arts education. We are privileged today to be able to hear from Michael Lomax, a graduate of the college, a person whose life's work reflects the liberal education and perspective. He will be introduced by Dr. Matthew Platt, following Dr. David Morrow, who will talk briefly about Phi Beta Kappa. Dr. Morrow. Thank you very much, Dr. Haynes. As stated, I am the secretary of the Delta of Georgia chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, and I'm pleased to make some remarks on behalf of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. The Greek letters refer to the words philosophia bio kubernetes, which means the love of wisdom is the guide of life. Founded in 1776 at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, the Phi Beta Kappa Society is the nation's oldest and most prestigious honors society. Chapters are housed at nearly 300 of the foremost colleges and universities throughout the United States. There are currently only four chapters at historically black colleges and universities. In 1953, chapters were chartered at Fisk University and Howard University. The Delta of Georgia chapter at Morehouse College was chartered in 1968 and the Epsilon of Georgia chapter at Spelman College was installed in 1998. In his book, Born to Rebel, Dr. Benjamin Mays writes, the installation and the in initiation of the first Morehouse students into Delta chapter in May of 1968 were historic events, which were the culmination of a journey, which really began in the basement of a church in Augusta, Georgia. Each triennium, we sent our credentials, and after each no, we worked harder for the academic excellence, which would qualify us. Now the dream had come true. Membership is by invitation, and according to the National Office of Phi Beta Kappa, I quote, chapters should identify candidates whose academic records demonstrate not only excellence, but also breadth and depth in the traditional disciplines of the natural sciences, mathematical, social sciences, and humanities. Select courses in other programs of study may be included only if they unambiguously embody the liberal arts and sciences. At least three quarters of the credits ordinarily required for a bachelor's degree in these fields should be in liberal studies. We look forward to inviting and inducting a new set of Morehouse College scholars into Phi Beta Kappa later this semester. 
At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Matthew Platt, professor in political science and assistant secretary of our chapter, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, uh, Dr. Morrow. I first became aware of Michael Lomax during my senior year at Morehouse in 2003. I was writing a senior thesis about culture war politics in Atlanta. And as the first black chairman of the Fulton County Commission, Dr. Lomax was a central figure in these fights in the early 1990s. When my thesis advisor told me that Dr. Lomax was a Morehouse man, the name took on an even greater prominence as I read through transcripts from county commission meetings. I Googled him and found out that he was the president of Dillard University at that time. And then I was, to my mind, oddly, kind of happy and excited for Dr. Lomax in 2004 when he became president and CEO of the United Negro College Fund, a position that he still holds. But then Dr. Lomax crushed all of my hopes and dreams four years ago when he spoke at the 50th induction ceremony for the Delta of Georgia chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. Dr. Lomax and the surviving members of the inaugural cohort of Phi Beta Kappa and Morehouse spoke at the ceremony. And that's when I realized that the Michael Lomax who had existed in my mind since 2003 was in fact a lie. He had majored in English, not political science. So the, the point is that I do not know Michael Lomax. <laughs> Prior to 2018, I had never met Michael Lomax. But because of his work and accomplishments, he was a first ballot inductee in my personal Morehouse Hall of Fame. I have actually told other alums, the college should be doing more to talk about Michael Lomax. And so while it's possible that I'm a weird outlier, Dr. Lomax, I, I think it's more likely that I'm just one of countless Black men whom you will never meet that have been shaped and inspired by your example of excellence. So I am truly honored to introduce a member of Morehouse's class of 1968, the first inductee in our chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, and the first member of our chapter to be elected to the Senate of Phi Beta Kappa, Dr. Michael Lomax. Dr. Platt, thank you very much for that, that wonderful and affecting uh, introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply moved by that. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about uh, you know, some of the work I've done uh, as I proceed with this, uh, this talk. Um, I wanna thank uh, the chapter of Delta of Georgia for the invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you at Morehouse this morning. You know, I am a proud Morehouse man. As Dr. Platt said, class of 1968, in just six years, in 2028, I will celebrate my 60th reunion. I intend to be there. Uh, I'm a little bit shocked that that's so close on the horizon. Uh, and, I, and some of my brothers, we're going to be there too, spry, uh, active, uh, and engaged. We were there for our 50th uh, and had a wonderful time and look forward to it. Uh, in 2028. I'm also going to say that in 2024, uh, good Lord willing, my grandson will become a Morehouse man. He is a sophomore at Morehouse. And there are actually two Michael Lomaxes who are sophomores, one from Houston, who I don't think I, I've never met. And I'm looking forward. Hope he'll, he'll watch this and reach out to me and I'll meet him. Uh, and then my grandson, Michael Lomax, who is from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and lives over in Purdue. So if you run into these guys, the one with uh, who lives in Purdue, that's my grandson. The other one, I don't know, and I want to meet him. Um, in my work at UNCF, I give a lot of talks about the importance of a college education. Most of the time, I am speaking to older people, and the purpose of my talk is to raise money for the United Negro College Fund. And typically, I am seeking to convince them to contribute to UNCF to fund scholarships for black college students or to fund operations for black colleges. And happily, we've been pretty successful at that work. Uh, March 31st, today, is the end of UNCF's fiscal year. It's an odd fiscal year. Most people have December 31st, some people have June 30th. We have March 31st, don't know why, but that's the end of our fiscal year. So tonight at midnight, we have to close our books, count our contributions, and determine if we have reached our goal 
which this year is a whopping $215 million, about three times what we have normally raised, although last year we raised $257 million. We only have a matter of hours to reach the, our goal. Yet here I am on Zoom speaking at Crown Forum where I'm not going to raise any money, I think. Uh, now, I was going to say at this point in my remarks, don't worry, I am not slacking off. But in fact, I am because I just got a positive COVID test, so I'm not going to do what I thought I was going to do when this was over. Uh, as soon as the program ended, I was going to run out of my house over in, South, in Northwest Atlanta and fly to Boston where I was going to speak at a fundraiser uh, for uh, UNCF this evening, uh, but alas, I am not. Uh, and I am, but I'm not worried, frankly, because I know that UNCF is going to make goal. Our goal of $215 million for our organization, even though I will not reach my own personal goal within the $215 million goal, my share of the goal is $100 million. Uh, but I believe my team and I will only raise $96 million this year. Happily, the other team will raise over $115 million and we will make our big goal. But this speech is important not because I will raise any money, but instead it is important because I am talking to you, men of Morehouse. And you are important because you are on your educational journey. And I want to do whatever I can to encourage and ensure your success. Now, Dr. Haynes, Dr. Morrow, and Dr. Platt are the officers of Morehouse's Phi Beta Kappa chapter. <clears throat> As they've told you, Phi Beta Kappa is the oldest and most respected honor society founded nearly 250 years ago in 1776. Morehouse was the third HBCU to have a chapter of Phi Beta Kappa following behind Fisk and Howard, as has been pointed out. Morehouse got his chapter in 68, and, and then in the 1990s, Spellman got their chapter. Long overdue. Long overdue. And as a member of the, the Phi Beta Kappa Senate, I'm doing everything I can to ask the question, why are there only four out of the nearly 300 chapters of Phi Beta Kappa? Uh, you think about some of the great institutions that are not members. Uh, the other HU, Hampton University, Xavier University, there are a, a range of institutions, Clark Atlanta University, which in my estimation, all of which should have Phi Beta Kappa chapters. Getting a chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, as has been pointed out by Dr. Haynes, at Morehouse was one of the great goals of Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays. He believed that a chapter would answer the question once and for all, that a lot of ignorant people would ask him, is Morehouse as good as a white college? Now, you know, you, you may not say, somebody would dare to ask Dr. Mays that question. People ask me the question, do we still need HBCUs all of the time? And, you know, I kind of want to do, give them a smack when they say that, although not for the same reasons that the smack heard around the world was given on Sunday. But I find it insulting. Uh, do we? I, I will look at people who ask that question, and they're typically not of our racial persuasion. And I'll say, you may not need them. You may not think you need them. But Black folks know we need them. HBCUs are foundational institutions in the Black community. Now, of course, I believe that Dr. Mays, who was not only one of the most elegant people I ever met in my life, one of the most scholarly people I ever met in my life, but also one of the one of the ones who could put you down without you knowing you'd been put down. Uh, I believe that Dr. Mays knew that Morehouse was better than most of the schools they were talking about. But he wanted just one more proof point. 
And a Phi Beta Kappa chapter was one more honor that he brought to the college during his 25 years as president. Dr. Mays was a persistent, determined, indefatigable human being. He was walking a path full of obstacles, but he never let an obstacle get him down. And every time Morehouse got turned down for a Phi Beta Kappa chapter, he would analyze the excuses and he and his team would get to work. Dr. Mays believed in black excellence. So he wanted only the best academic programs at this small college. And you know, Morehouse, when I got here in 1964, there were only a thousand students at Morehouse. There were only 300 students in the freshman class. This was a very small institution, but it had very, very big aspirations. Dr. Mays was strategic. He recruited exceptional faculty who could teach demanding courses. And he was always on the hunt for faculty members who also had a Phi Beta Kappa key. Because in order to get a Phi Beta Kappa chapter, a certain percentage, a percentage of the uh, faculty had to be members of Phi Beta Kappa. The curriculum was, liberal, was a liberal arts curriculum, concentrating in such subjects as history, religion, philosophy, literature, and the sciences, chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics. He wanted Morehouse men to go on to the finest graduate schools to earn PhDs, or to professional schools to earn medical, dental, and law degrees. He proceeded strategically to get Phi Beta Kappa on this campus. One of the last hurdles in, in the late 1960s was that Morehouse had to teach a classical language. That meant it had to have Greek or Latin in the curriculum. He didn't think Greek was the right language, so he went out and found a Latin professor, Lois Kropa. So he had removed one barrier. Then he had to figure out who was going to take Latin? <laughs> and he found two students, one of whom named Yancey from the, from, from the very prominent Yancey family in Atlanta, uh, was a really nice young man who was going to be a doctor. But he was Catholic, and he'd gone to Catholic school, so he had had some Latin. And he, could, he knew Latin. But the other student was me. I knew no Latin. I was a Spanish major, double major in English and Spanish. I had to drop my Spanish courses and take Latin, but I needed to do it because I was going to go to graduate school to get a PhD in English. And in order to get that PhD at any of the graduate schools, I would have to pass a reading exam in a, in a classical language. Uh, and so Dr. Mays, in preparing, a, meeting a requirement of, of, of Phi Beta Kappa, establishing a Latin program at Morehouse, was also paving the way for my future success at Columbia University. And I took two years of Latin at Morehouse. I was the only student the second year in the class. So I had basically a tutorial in Latin three days a week, which means I couldn't say the dog ate my homework. I had to have my homework. And when I got to Columbia, I sat for my Latin exam and passed it on the first, uh, the first take. Over time, Morehouse in introduced uh, other more career-focused majors to follow up on a point that Dr. Haynes made. Business, computer science, and engineering. But at its core, Morehouse remained a liberal arts college where, the where you study the disciplines that are more focused on intellectual development than professional training. The motto of Phi Beta Kappa, as Dr. Morrow has noted, is, is you know, tr translated sometimes the love of philosophy, sometimes the love of learning. 
But in either case, and I'll use learning, the love of learning is the guide of life. So it was created for a, another generation of gentle men and gentle women who would spend their time contemplating uh, the great works, history. And they did that as a part of their development as individuals, not for any utilitarian purpose. As a student, I embraced that notion. And I worked hard as an English major and a history and Spanish minor to immerse myself in my intellectual development at Morehouse College. When I graduated and went on to Columbia in New York, nobody in my classes knew anything about Morehouse. This was 1968. But I was well prepared and easily earned my master's in one year. So I could leave Columbia and come back to Morehouse and teach English. Why you ask would I wanna do that? Why not pursue a PhD? Well, because the Vietnam War was going on and I had a low selective service number and I was about to be drafted. But the one way I could stay out of the army and stay out of the Vietnam War was to teach at a historically black college. And of course, I chose Morehouse and Morehouse chose me. Um, from all the focus that we have on the love of learning, um, there was a, there was a more to a great education at Morehouse than just the, that love of learning. Dr. Mays embedded in the education at Morehouse and the education of Morehouse men, not just their pursuit of knowledge. He added to that the pursuit of purpose because Dr. Mays believed that there is more expected of us than mere knowledge for its own sake or in order to enhance our intellects or our aspirational goals for career. Dr. Mays expected Morehouse men to develop a keen sense of purpose in our lives. Purpose would give meaning to our lives because the most important purpose we could embrace is to make a difference in the world. Dr. Haynes, you referred to leadership. Uh, I believe that was one of the ways of expressing that making a purpose in the world. So every day when Dr. Mays was president, freshmen had to go to Sale Hall Chapel. I'm gonna tell you something, it's a wonderful building, but it had the most uncomfortable seats on the entire campus. They were wooden, uh, they were unforgiving, and you had to sit there <laughs> for an hour at a time to listen to some of the greatest speakers that I've ever experienced in my life. Mostly they were black men who could be role models for us, whose presence and lives could serve as examples of what he expected of us. Lives of purpose and meaning, lives of leadership, lives that would make a difference in the world. I remember perhaps most vividly, the great theologian, Howard Thurman, who would annually come to the Morehouse campus. And as you know, Dr. Thurman, I believe was a 1919 graduate of the college from Florida. Howard Thurman gave these, enrapt, these rapturous speeches, these lectures. Uh, he, he had a, a manner that was almost uh, hypnotic. And I recall one, one lecture in particular where he talked about divine discontent and how it was important for all of us to reject complacency and it reminds me today now of, of Martin Luther King's 
notion of the fierce urgency of now. And of course, Dr. Thurman influenced King so directly. Dr. Mays was audacious and demanding. Think about it. A poor little college on a hill in Atlanta. Thousand students, a very small endowment, older buildings. I remember most of my classes were in Sale Hall Annex, which I think was a, a temporary building built during World War II. It's still there, so it wasn't so temporary after all. Uh, it's been upgraded, but that's where all the English classes were taught. But you know, the buildings really weren't what you came to Morehouse for. He believed that this small college in Atlanta, Georgia, could and would produce graduates who would change the world. Graduates whose purpose was, yes, to pursue the professional and uh, to pursue their professions and to produce Black excellence a concept which Dr. Mays believed long before we heard it being used on a regular basis. And he believed that Morehouse's purpose was to produce leaders as well. Leaders committed to uplifting their own people and changing the world that marginalized and oppressed Black people. We might be what W.E.B. Du Bois termed the talented 10, because we were getting this opportunity for education. But our responsibility was to lift up others as we climb the other 90%. For Dr. Mays, the liberal arts, the pursuit of knowledge was important, but being a leader, making a difference, changing the world, those are what he expected of us as Morehouse Ben. The ethos of lifting while you climb, an ethic that we take for granted at historically black colleges is not the ethic that underpins most education in America today. Most education in America is get what you can for you and keep moving on. But the ethos at Black colleges, articulated beautifully at Morehouse, but also at others, was one of reciprocity, one of shared responsibility, uh, a sense of community, a sense of purpose, not just to get for yourself, but to achieve in behalf of your people. I have a first edition of Dr. Mays's autobiography, Born to Rebel. Dr. Mays wrote that book with the assistance of the first secretary of the Delta of Georgia chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, Jeanette Hume, who was a professor uh, of English and probably the single person that I took more course, courses from while I was at Morehouse. And they would meet every day at lunchtime in the faculty lounge in Merrill Hall. And he would review with her the writings of the night before and she would work on editing. So I saw that book in its production. Uh, but I also got him to inscribe my copy. And he, all, he, he gave just a very brief inscription, but it says so much about what he thought about the students he was producing. It merely said, expecting much of you, Benjamin Elijah Mays, expecting much of you. And that's what Morehouse did. It set high expectations. And I'll tell you, when Dr. May set a high expectation, it was a high expectation. And to this day, I think I am answering to 
that admonition, expecting much of you. When I was a student from 1964 to 1968, obviously the great example, exemplar of the best of Morehouse was then as now, Martin Luther King Jr. Now just think about it. I was a student here at Morehouse during the final years of Dr. King's ministry and life. I had first met Martin King in 1957 at my home in Los Angeles, California. My mother was a journalist. We owned a small paper in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Tribune. My mother was the chief writer. And then in 1956, she said, the biggest story of my lifetime is happening in Montgomery, Alabama. She told my father, I'm, <laughs> and her six children, I'm going to take a week off and I'm going to go to Montgomery, Alabama, and I'm going to witness the bus boycott. She went to Montgomery. She met Rosa Parks. She met Ralph Abernathy. She met the King. She had dinner at their home. And a year later, when Dr. King came to Los Angeles, uh, my mother invited him over for cake and ice cream. And all six of her children sat on the floor as she interviewed him for uh, her uh, column in the newspaper the following week. He was then a real living, breathing human being who from time to time came on campus to speak, and rally us as students to march with him as he did to the state capitol when they refused to seat the duly elected Julian Bond and the Georgia General Assembly because he dared to oppose the war in Vietnam. Coretta Scott King, I remember hearing her rehearsing in Sale Hall Chapel for a, a fundraiser in concert that she was giving to raise money for the SCLC, Daddy King, his father was a trustee. His sister, Christine King Ferris, was teaching at Spelman. His mother was a distinguished alumna of Spelman. So we saw those people as our role models. Um, they weren't just names or photographs and books. They were living, breathing people who set a standard for us in that generation. But the last time I saw Dr. King was in April of 1968, when his body lay in state in an open casket in Sisters Chapel for the days preceding his funeral on the Morehouse campus. And thousands of people stood quietly in line, snaking off of the Spelman campus waiting for their opportunity to bid farewell to Martin Luther King. Dr. King had been one of the first men of Morehouse to come under the spell of Benjamin E. Mays. And Martin King had pursued learning, yet he had also evolved his own personal sense of purpose. He had deployed his deep knowledge of scripture and philosophy and ethics as he ministered to his small congregation at the Dixwell Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. And from there, he had inspired his congregants, his people, the nation, and the world. He had loved learning. He had gained knowledge but at Morehouse, he had also found purpose. And the rest is history. I remember one of my classmates. I came to Morehouse at the age of 16. This, this young man came to Morehouse at the age of 14. His name was Benjamin Ward. And Ben was also in that first class of Morehouse students to be inducted into Phi Beta Kappa. We were both Merrill early admission scholars. He had come a year before me, but he was graduating with me, much to my chagrin, because he wound up being number one in the class and I wound up being number two. He sharp elbowed me out. 
because he had spent a year studying at the Sorbonne in, in Paris. And he was an incredible guy. He, he, he spoke elegant French. He studied philosophy, but he was a wonderful musician. And he played the organ at Notre Dame. But he was from Montgomery, Alabama. And I remember seeing a photograph of Ben and another classmate of ours standing next to Rosa Parks on Fair Street as Dr. King's caisson came up from Auburn Avenue to the campus for the funeral. I have never seen grief like the grief I saw on Ben's face, the sense of loss I saw on Rosa Parks' face at that moment in that photograph, capturing their observation of his final journey to this college. Young men, you, you, you are men of Morehouse. You are here to get a Morehouse education, one that will combine the pursuit of knowledge with the discovery of your purpose. Finding your purpose is not easy, just as producing Black excellence is not easy. So take your time. Don't be in such a hurry. Explore. Take a lot of different courses that may not seem like they're exactly relevant to what you think you want to do. But don't shortchange yourself. You'll never have another experience like the four years, sometimes the five or six, that you will spend at Morehouse College. And I'll tell you that when you gain age and wisdom, you will look back on this and say, those were the years that shaped me. These years at Morehouse will shape you and they will resonate with you and give deeper meaning as you age and mature. Today, I know that looking into Martin Luther King's casket, was a moment of personal epiphany for me. It gave substance to my life. It was a recognition that he had had such great purpose and such great belief that he would give his life for another generation and generations yet unborn so that we might live our lives differently. We have have lives of purpose and repay Dr. King for his sacrifice. Finding my purpose was not easy for me. I was a good student, but I was not sure what I wanted to do with my life. But I knew that I had to have purpose bigger than a great job and a big income. For years after graduation, I studied to find, I, I struggled to find my purpose. I taught English here at Morehouse and at Spelman. Not my purpose. For five years, I worked for <coughs> another Morehouse graduate, Maynard, <coughs> Maynard Jackson, when he first became mayor of Atlanta in 1974. Not my purpose. I ran for public office and served for 14 years as the chairman of the Fulton County Commission not my purpose. I ran for mayor of Atlanta in 1993, but lost convincingly and didn't blame the Fulton County Commission for my loss, not my purpose. I became president of Dillard University in New Orleans, almost, but not quite my purpose. 18 years ago, I became president of the United Negro College Fund, and I found my purpose supporting our HBCUs and thousands of students 
like you and your, and your brothers at Morehouse. Each of you has a purpose, a calling, that will enable you to make a difference in the world, maybe as a scientist or as a businessman or as a teacher or a minister, or as a young man I saw in New York on Monday named Jeter as a designer for Ralph Lauren, or perhaps as an entrepreneur, whatever you choose as your profession, remember that your purpose is more than your career, your profession, or your job. Your purpose is to be a leader and change the world. Black excellence is what Morehouse demands. Black excellence is what the liberal arts education at Morehouse enables and is preparing you for. Purpose, service, leadership of our people and in behalf of our community are your higher calling. I know you can do it, men of Morehouse. Keep figuring out what your purpose is. Keep pursuing Black excellence in that liberal arts curriculum. That sense of purpose is what Morehouse College, which is liberal education, gives you that is distinctive and unlike any other institution. And remember, Dr. Mays and Dr. Lomax are expecting much of you. Thank you. Let's give Dr. Lomax a virtual round of applause for that wonderful, inspiring speech. Thank you so much, sir, for being here with us. We appreciate it very much. We will, would like to have some questions and answers. And if you would please, everyone, use your hand raise feature, and then I will call on you to see who will be unmuted and be able to ask Dr. Lomax any questions that you may have. We'll take a few minutes for, for that. Well, I'll start with one. Other than Latin, what do you think your most interesting course was at Morehouse and how did it help you with what you're doing now? You know, uh, I was an English major. And the one thing you do when you're in English is you do a lot of writing. And there were a couple of other guys in my class who were not English majors, but they were, one of whom was an English major, another of whom was a political science major. They were both from Durham, North Carolina, and they became two of my closest friends. And I would say that one of the things that we've used in our lives, and one has become a business executive of great success, and the other one has become a lawyer who is the, has a named firm in Atlanta, the largest black law firm in the city learning to write uh, <laughs> under the demanding uh, and challenging uh, expectations of members of the English department. That was number one. So I live, I use my writing every day. Uh, I would tell you last night when I had to write this speech, I was struggling. And, uh, but you know, you sit in front of that screen and you get it done. Uh, so the writing, I, the other thing that I think I, I really, and I wasn't that good at it, but I've had to use it so much that I've gotten better at it, was public speaking. You know, that, that's my bread and butter. That's how I make my case. That's how I persuade people. And um, I saw some of the greatest orators. I listened to some of the greatest orators of, you know, from our community in the chapel at Morehouse and uh, public speaking. And then I took public speaking over at Spelman 
uh, from uh, John Wesley Dobbs' daughter, Millicent Dobbs Jordan. And uh, it was a more enjoyable course over there for a lot of reasons. And I got to be pretty good at it. And I'd say those two, writing and public speaking, uh, have been you know tools in my toolkit that I use every day. And I hone those skills at Morehouse. We have a question from a student, Javian Moore. Um, I appreciate you. And I just would like to ask you, how did you recognize your purpose considering everything that you were involved in? Um, how did you recognize what your purpose was specifically? Well, you know, I kept thinking my purpose was the purpose of somebody else who was a role model. I thought, you know, I said, oh my God, you know, I, I want to be just like Martin Luther King. I, I'm not, no, I'm not a minister. So, but I, I wanted to be able to have that kind of impact. And that was the wrong kind of impact for me. I was not going to move, you know, millions with a, an inspirational speech. I worked for Maynard Jackson and Maynard was the first black mayor of Atlanta. And I was a speech writer for him. And I was a researcher for him. And I worked in his office. I worked in his campaign. And then I uh, left Morehouse when he got elected and, and went to work in his administration. And I wanted so badly. I got so excited about the work that he did. You know, because I've been teaching English for a couple of years. And you know, when he, I thought that was important. You know, I was helping people learn how to write. I was teaching literature. But when I worked for Maynard, I was there changing the city. You know, I was having bigger impact. And I realized I wanted to have that impact. But ultimately, over time, and, and the voters of, of, of Fulton County, I realized that I was not a political. It was really when I got to UNCF. When I, well, when I got to Dillard, and I, I thought Dillard was a great opportunity and I, I did a lot of work there for seven years to strengthen the institution. But I wanted to be on a larger, a, a larger, in a larger arena. I wanted to have more impact. And when the presidency of, of the United Negro College Fund became available, I had to choose that I want to be comfortable at Dillard, turning a wonderful college, or a wonderful small university into a stronger institution. Or did I want to have transformational impact on the education of my people? And I said, this is my one chance at transformational impact. And for the last 18 years, that's the work I've done. Now, you know, I don't give big speeches. I raise money. But we've raised $3 billion in the 18 years I've been at UNCF. And we're going to do a capital campaign a little bit larger than the one that Dr. Thomas is going to do for Morehouse. But that will transform UNCF's ability to support our colleges and our students. We've helped over 100,000 students since I've been a president of UNCF. And every one of those students I consider to be my legacy. And the greatest honor I've had in the service at UNCF was an honor bestowed by my good friends, Patty Quillen and Reed Hastings when Reed gave $40 million to Morehouse, his only condition for that scholarship program was that it was named after me. And I feel like that that's my legacy. I have a couple of scholarship programs and we've got an endowed scholarship that I'm raising money for at Morehouse and they're all for Michael Lomax scholars because I think the impact I have for students, uh, Javian, I think that's, that's, that's the gift that keeps, keeps on giving because as you live your life and you make all the changes you can make in the world, if I've helped you do that, then you're doing that for and with me and not just yourself. So I think that's for me been my greatest, um, that's how I found my purpose. And that is my purpose. My purpose is to enable young people and to strengthen black colleges, the most important educational institutions in the black community. Thank you so much. Another question we have is um, from Isaac McKinney. Yes, yes. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Dr. Lomax. Uh, my question was, if you could do it all over again, 
uh, what would you do differently? And also, do you have any uh, regrets regrets as well? No. You know, first of all, I'm not going to get to do it all over again, so I'm not going to waste a lot of energy on that. But I believe, I believe that every mistake, every failure is your greatest opportunity to learn. And I've done some dumb things. I've done some ill-considered things. I have fallen on my face. But I learned more from my mistakes and my failures than I did from my successes. And so I don't, I don't want to have a lot more of them. I, mean, I feel like I've had more than enough, but I don't want to, I, I would say to most, and that's what I say to young people, look, embrace failure. Because if you're not failing, that means you're not trying to do things that are aspirational. And uh, you want to learn from them. You don't want to just repeat those mistakes, but um, push yourself and don't be afraid to fail or to have, uh, you know, not always to have success. That's, I think that's the best. And I learned that lesson from a Canadian businessman who I spent some time with. And he just said, and he, he, he had made a big mistake that gotten him into a lot of trouble. But he said that's what he where he learned the most, and I thought it was one of the best pieces of advice I ever received. And so don't don't be fearful of failure, embrace it, learn from it, and keep on moving on. I know we're at the end of our hour. We have one more student question, and that is from Alexandria Green. Yes, hi. Um... I know I don't attend Morehouse, but my name is Alexandria Greenley. I currently attend Spelman as a second year biology major. And I think you kind of answered this with Javion, but I'll just go ahead and ask. And I wanted to know, um, do you think your purpose changed depending on uh, where you were in your life? Oh, yes. I, I mean, sometimes the purpose, you're not ready for it. Uh, it's a big purpose. It requires maturity. It ex requires experience. So I think that your purpose, I think your purpose evolves. And uh, I, I think I always knew that I wanted to help people. I always knew that I wanted to develop people. I didn't know that I always wanted to, in, to, to work on institutions and strengthening institutions. But when I found that, that I was good at that and, and then the work with people, I think I found it, but it took time to get there. So I think you have to be patient with yourself because if you force yourself to do something that you're not ready for, you won't do it well. Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, listen to your internal self. And, and I think that you'll hear, uh, you'll know it when you hear it and you'll follow it and it will, it will give you great reward. And uh, I, I pray that you find yours. Thank you very much. And Alexandria, I'm sorry I couldn't spotlight you, but thank you for your question. We really appreciate it. Dr. Haynes, you have the last question, sir. Thank you for the presentation. So, so my question has to do with the concern that I have about the continued lack of financial resources of historically black colleges. Um, so I figured that you've been studying them for a number of years and have been thinking about what we can do to move faster. Um, in terms of financial resources, what 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 do we need to do to to do a better job at this? You know, I would say first of all, um, a lot of the reason why we don't have financial resources isn't because we're not trying to get them. It's because uh, so much of America has devalued and disparaged, mm -hmm. and not thought black colleges were worth the investment. And, you know, so we gotta, we've got to change those attitudes. And I believe they are changing. You know, I told you that we raised $257 million last year, $215 million this year. I never expected that to happen, Dr. Haynes. In, in a good year at, more, at, at UNCF, we were raising 80 or $90 million. But after COVID and people saw just how inequitable our nation is, and how people at the bottom were hurt the most. And then after the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery and all of the people started saying, there's something wrong here and we've got to fix it. And, and without us saying something, they said one of the solves is UNCF. One of the solves 
is black colleges. I believe not everybody is convinced of that, but I would tell you people in the black community, number one, believe it. And we have over, we have over 190,000 donors to UNCF. The vast majority of those people are black. They give a small amount, a large number of people give a small amount, but our people believe in what we do. We just don't have a lot of money. But we also now are getting a lot of very wealthy people who for years told me, eh, black colleges, they're yesterday, they're not today. But I think as, we, as, as people understand the brilliance of what happens on our campuses, you know, I, when, when Reed Hastings and his wife gave uh, two years ago, I've known Reed Hastings for 16 years. I've been telling that brother, I said, man, you got to come to Black College. You got to come see him. He said, nah. And I, Black College, he, said, he gave to his college. I think he went to Bowdoin or Bates or someplace. I mean, he's always giving. I, I said, Reed, Reed, you want to help Black people? You need to give to Black colleges. And I got so mad at one of the meetings I was in with him that he just, he thought I was going to have a tear. And he just grabbed me and said, all right, all right, all right. We'll come and visit. And I arranged a visit to Morehouse, Spellman, and CAU for him and his wife. I curated the visit. And CAU didn't have a permanent president. Dr. French was not there, so I'm, I'm so heartbroken. But when he talked to Dr. Thomas, when he talked to, and we, we Reed and I are on the board of KIPP, and when he talked to Kipsters, who come from KIPP charter schools to, to Morehouse, and they told him what Morehouse meant to them, why it was the right college, the right place, the most powerful experience they ever had. When he talked to a group of KIPP charter school students who were about to go off to black colleges in the fall, and, and they just said, I want to go to a school where I get to be me, where I don't have to perform, where I get to develop myself. And he was like blown away. And then we closed out at Spelman College in, in Reynolds Cottage. We'd already met with Dr. Thomas and Dr. Thomas did a great job. We, we, it was Rosalind Brewer, the chair of the Spelman board and Mary Schmidt Campbell. And he'd already met with some Spelman students. And they just, he was so blown away. Next day he called me, I'm gonna give you guys a million dollars each. And I said, well, that's wonderful because you've only been giving me a hundred thousand dollars. You know, I've been trying to get more and you're gonna increase that. I said, thank you very much. Then, after George Floyd was there, it was a Sunday evening in June. I got a, an email from Reed. And he said, I've been, he said, I've been talking to Dr. Campbell and to Dr. Thomas. And Patty and I have decided to give Morehouse $20 million, Spellman $20 million for scholarship and UNCF $20 million. And he said, the only condition is that, that at Morehouse, they'll name the scholarship after you. I couldn't even respond to that. I told him I'm so moved by that, that I can't even say anything. Then about 24 hours later, no, maybe 36 hours later, I, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I looked at my phone and there was an email from Patty Quillen. And she said, you know, we give to Black Lives Matters and they tell us that when the check you write doesn't make your hand sweat, it's the wrong check. So Reed and I have decided to give each of you, Morehouse, Spellman, and UNCF, $40 million. That took me 16 years to get that, Dr. <laughs> but a pretty good return on my time and investment. I believe we're making the case. But we're not going to get where we need to go until white America changes their attitude toward black colleges and to black people. Uh, our colleges have been underfunded. Our, our public institutions have gotten less than their, their white peers. It's an inequitable world we live in. We still got a lot of changing to do. But we're going to do a lot of training at UNCF and we're building a, a fundraising institute and we're going to get even better at that. But I'm going to tell you, we work real hard at UNCF. We've gotten very good at what we do. We partner with Morehouse, we partner with Spelman, we partner with CAU, and we're going to raise more money. And when Morehouse raises its money, you know, UNCF raises a billion dollars, a lot of that money that we raise 
will be money that will come back to Morehouse and to Spelman and CAU and to Morris Brown and to all of the other institutions. Uh, because our institutions don't need a billion dollars. They need a hundred billion dollars. You know, Harvard has a 40 plus, probably about $60 billion endowment. You put all the endowments of all the black colleges together, it's $4 billion. That's an unfair advantage. And it's an extreme inequity. Unfair advantage and extreme inequity have to change. But in the meantime, we're going to keep hustling. Right. I'm going to try and get some more money. Good. My alma mater, Morehouse Good. College. Thank you all for letting me be with you today. I love you and I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. We will close with the college hymn. You